Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. Welcome along uh, to our service uh, this evening. It's brilliant that you came. Thanks for doing that. Um, And those of you watching along online, it's great to have you too, whether you are with us now or in the future. Um, My name is Andy and uh, yeah, exactly. And I'll be leading us through our time together this evening. My colleague Louise is going to be speaking to us from the Bible later and John chapter 17. As we begin, listen to these like incredible words from Romans 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Why, uh, Why have we gathered here tonight? Friends, what are we here to do? (laughs) We gather as a thankful people who delight to praise God for who he is and all that he's done. And we gather as an imperfect people who desperately need the grace and forgiveness that only comes from Jesus. We gather as an expectant people Longing to encounter the living God by his spirit. And we gather as a listening people. Excited to hear the voice of our loving father in his word. Let's pray together. Will you stand with me? We're going to sing in a moment. But let's pray together as we begin our service. Our father, we need you. And Lord, we love you. And God, you are glorious beyond compare. Father, you are better than we could ever express or our words could come close to. We thank you for your power and your wonder and your majesty and your awe and your grace and your mercy, your forgiveness and your love, your compassion and your beauty and your endless, endless love for us. We praise you, God. We want to meet you tonight. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing together. Let us worship our King. Come, let us worship our King. Oh, 
Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high above. You have done great things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, I shake your bow. Hallelujah, you have done great How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying Paid my ransom. 
Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, His wounds have paid. Jesus, we love you and we are astounded by those wounds. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you took on flesh and went to the cross, scorning its shame, dying to take away our sin, rising, proving that you were exactly who you said you were, ascending into glory in heaven. Father, we are so grateful for the gospel. Lord, we don't deserve your love, but we are amazed and grateful beyond words for the love that you have for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please do grab a seat. A couple of little things to let you uh, know about this week. One is tremendously exciting, and that is that tomorrow night is our APCM. I was about to try and say what it is. Annual parochial ch church meeting. Is that right? I think I'm a vicar now. There we go. Um, yeah, please do come along. It's half past seven. Ben said something this morning like APCMs are rubbish if no one comes or something like that. So um, that it'll be great to see you there. Uh, please do uh, come along here about what's going on in the life of the church. Um, We'll be uh, sorting out uh, who's on the church council, stuff like that. So um, it'll be a riot. So can't wait to see you at that. Alice, come and tell us something. Wow, how'd you follow that? <laughs> Easily, thanks, Sally. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Alice. I'm the youth worker here at St. George's. Um, and if you're in year... 11 and year 13 you might want to just close your ears at this point um, but it is uh, exam season or exam season is very quickly approaching for many of our young people um, in our church and we love our young people we care for them and I know you guys too and um, we would really love to be upholding our young people in prayer over this um, season I'm sure you can cast your mind back to uh, whenever you had to sit your exams and um, how stressful it was, but um, being able to, you know, some people can't remember, <laughs> but the, the fact that we can pray for our young people, for them to encounter God's peace, to develop good rhythms of rest and revision, um, for them to be salt and light in the exam hall. Some of our young people will be the only Christian in the exam hall sitting that um, specific exam. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they were a witness um, for the peace of God, which passes all understanding as they do that? Um, so why am I telling you this, other than to stress out our young people in the room? Um, well, I would love to pair up every young person who's sitting exams over the next couple of months with a member or more of the congregation. Um, so you will receive a timetable for this young person. You will be able to pray for them as they revise, but also know when their exams are, be able to share encouragements with them um, and uphold them in prayer. Let them know that the church family loves for, um, them and is caring for them. We've got 14 young people. Um, who are going to be sitting exams over this next couple of weeks. I've started to get some timetables already, so I would love to hear from you if that's something you feel like you could do. We don't have to be capped at 14. Wouldn't it be amazing to get 28 and every young person's got two people um, praying for them or even more? But um, if that's something you feel you can do, if you're interested, um, either catch me at the back at the end of the service, send me an email, drop me a text. Um, I'd love to hear from you and do be praying for our young people. Thank you. Cheers, Annie. Thanks, Alice. We are going to turn to pray now. Firstly, uh, remembering all the gifts that God has given us, I'm praying that he might use them in the service of his kingdom. So hopefully there'll be some words on the screen to help us out. Lord, everything we have comes from you. Please use our gifts to build your kingdom. The truth is that there's not a single one of us who has lived perfectly this week. Some of us have done a better job than others. Some of us have really struggled this week to live for Jesus. 
But the wonderful truth of knowing Jesus is that it's not about our performance or our good deeds. It's about his love for us and how he came to save us. And he has told us that if we confess our sins, he will forgive us. So we're going to do that together now. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. We pray together, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And so may the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from all our sins, that we may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to continue in prayer now. And as we do, um, I'm going to pray for some things. I'm also going to leave some space uh, for us to pray for some things. And Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was a guy in, 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 uh, this morning asking Jesus to come into your heart. Yeah. Is, not, is it true or is it <coughs> or Brilliant. Like, um, like, the question for those on YouTube or who couldn't hear was, is Jesus still alive and how does it all work? Uh, let me say briefly, and let's chat after the service, but let me say briefly, yes. Uh, 2,000 years later, they still haven't found the body because he rose from the dead. And that is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. And we are so excited about the fact that Jesus is alive. And he has sent his spirit to empower us to live for him. We can be sure of that. And that is good news. But let's chat a bit more after the service. Andy. I'll come and find you at the end, okay? Andy Pandy. Andy Pandy. Brilliant. <laughs> Let's pray. And as we do, um, we're going to use a little chorus uh, to help us, and I'm going to sing it to you. You probably know it already, but just in case you don't, and then we're all going to sing it uh, together as we go through our time of prayer. And it goes like this. Oh, Lord, hear my prayer. Oh, Lord, hear my prayer. When I call. Answer me, O Lord, hear my prayer, O Lord, hear my prayer, come and listen to me. Father, we pray for our world. And Lord, we especially bring to you tonight the growing humanitarian crisis in Sudan. Lord Jesus, we know you reign and rule over all things. and We ask you for an end to the bloodshed in that nation. We leave some space for us all to bring requests of prayers for our world.
our Father, we cry out to you for our nation. And Lord, we particularly bring to you tonight the rising cost of living and the impact that is having. Father, we know that you particularly have a heart for the poor and the widow and the orphan. And tonight, Father, we pray for the least in our society, that they would not be forgotten. Father, empower your church to rise up in action to help those struggling. Lord, we pray too about the strike action going on. And we ask especially for the impact on our health service to be lessened upon the most vulnerable once more. And we leave a moment of quiet for us to bring any uh, requests of prayer to our loving Heavenly Father for our nation. Father, we pray for our church and our network of churches here in South Lincolnshire. Father, tonight we want to pray especially for St. John's Church in Spalding. We praise you, Father, for the congregation there, for um, the love of Jesus in that church. Father, we pray that you might empower them in ministry and mission to Spalding. Father, we pray very much for the Knowles family as they prepare to go out from here to Spalding. Father, we know that you go before us, you go behind us, you hem us in on all sides. Father, would uh, Richard and Sally and Jack and Joseph, would they know that? Would they know your presence with them? Father, as Richard prepares for ordination and um, the fears and worries and anxieties that come to that begin to stack up, Father, would you give him your peace? And Father, would you choose to use that family to do brilliant things in that church in Spalding, we pray. Lord, too, we pray uh, for our mission partner, Mo Power, in Uganda. And we beg of you, Father, for this uh, court case that is going on. Lord, would justice be done and would peace reign in Mo's heart? And Lord, we do pray too for the ongoing ministries of St. George's Church here in Stamford. Father, would you choose to build up Christians and to reach out to the lost, we pray. We leave a moment of quiet to lift any specific prayer requests for the life of our church.
stand together. It's a declaration and a prayer, this song.
invite you to fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. And we declare our dependence on you being in our lives. Lord, I declare out that I need you. I need your filling. I need your refreshment. Lord, I want my eyes to rest upon you. My soul will rest in your embrace, Lord. For I am yours and you are mine. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Lord, let us all walk upon the waters. Lord, fill us, we pray. Envision us, Lord. You are here, healing 
thank you for who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please do grab a seat. Hello. A quick one. Simon? I don't, I don't think he is tonight, no. Okay, let's, let's catch up afterwards. Um, we're going to come to uh, uh, read from the Bible now and hear God's word taught to us. So please do locate one in the vicinity around you. If you don't have one, um, Merv will supply you with one. Uh, so stick up your hand and one will come to you. And Marion's going to read uh, for us and Louise is going to come and speak. So let me pray for us that we have uh, hearts, minds and eyes ready to receive from the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we've declared together tonight that we need you and that you are here with us. And so we pray you would speak to us in your word by your spirit, and you would change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight's reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, beginning at verse 20. Jesus is getting near to the end of his life, and he's prayed for his disciples and now he's praying for all believers. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me wherever I am and to see my glory the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know yet, the, sorry, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Good evening. Hello. Thank you, Ben. I've got a flip chart. That's a little bit old school, but just no, run with it. Sorry about that. So, um, thank you for having me. I've got. I'm going to start with um, three quotes from three different conversations, from three different people, um, all of which I had this week. It's the long, dark nights you have to watch out for. It makes you feel unloved, isolated, hopeless, and forgotten. It's like the silent killer. Three different people, three conversations this week, and they were all talking about loneliness. And loneliness is our theme for today. So we're in a sermon series called Mending a Broken World, and today we're going to be looking at this issue of loneliness. And we're going to be exploring what the Bible says about it, the whole Bible. So we're not going to have an in-depth Bible study on the prayer that we've just read from Jesus, but we are going to get there, and we are going to use it because it is amazing. But we're going to start and look through, um, look through the whole Bible. So there are 3.3 million people in Britain who would describe themselves as chronically lonely. That's feeling lonely all of the time. So not just situational loneliness where um, you might get if you are experiencing grief or if you've just moved house or if you've changed your job, if things have changed, but that feeling of being lonely all of the time. And it's this loneliness that um, can be really bad for your health. So not just mentally in terms of um, 
leading to depression or suicidal thoughts, but actually really bad for your health physically as well. Apparently, chronic loneliness is as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. I'm not quite sure how they worked that out. <laughs> so the number of people who live alone has doubled in the last 50 years. As a society, we have become a people who live increasingly independent lives. And we live a lot less in community, don't we? When I first moved into my house, I was mortified when I saw that it had a three-foot fence across the garden between us and the neighbours. I couldn't believe it. And, um, and when I saw that this looked like a very new fence, I was even more distraught because I thought, oh no, there's no way I'm going to get a nice six-foot-high fence anytime soon. But I cannot tell you what a blessing that three-foot fence has been to me. As my messy life has been rather forcibly shared with my neighbours, a huge amount of blessing has come. I mean, they know like when my children leave house to live under the trampoline or when I have to sit on the back steps with my head in my hand and count to ten before I can walk back through the door. And they've been incredible. We moved into that house just before lockdown and the hours they spent playing frisbee over the fence with my kids and water fights and amazing. Yeah, the cups of tea that have been handed to me and the children that I have handed over that three-foot fence has been incredible. But, like, we're not made to live alone. We're made to live in community. And, and when we do share our lives, huge blessing can come back. We're not designed to live alone. So we're going to look at what the Bible says about loneliness. Um, let's start at the beginning. That's a good place to start, isn't it? So um, if you can get there, you can flick to Genesis. Right at the beginning, Genesis 1. Verse 26. There we go. This is literally the first page. You can get that. Right at the end of the first page. It says, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Notice the plural there. Our God is a relational God. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been in constant relationship with one another since forever. And it is in his image that we have been made. We are made to be relational. And then if you just flip the page and skip to Genesis 2, verse 18, we read, this is just after the Lord has made Adam... It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So God says it is not good for the man to be alone. After a whole chapter of God making things and declaring them good, God looks at Adam's aloneness and he says, that is not good. And then he creates a woman. We need one another. We need one another. It's how we've been made. It's in our makeup. We need each other. And so if today you're here and you are feeling lonely, then of course it hurts. Because it's not how we're made to be. And he looks at your aloneness and he says, that's not good. That's not good. The government recognized loneliness as a major issue. And in 2018, the first ever the world's first ever government strategy for tackling loneliness was published. So that's how much of an issue it is. Every year, year on year, loneliness increases, and it hasn't gone down since the spike of COVID. In one of the case studies that was put forward, um, one gentleman <laughs> describes loneliness as being like a Venn diagram. Now, a Venn diagram is one of those diagrams that is like interlocking circles. And I drew you a picture, okay? So, visual aid number one. I know, I know, this is exciting. And this is why I pre-did it, because I thought freehand circles weren't a great idea. So, um, this gentleman describes loneliness as being like a circle right out on your own, where actually you're not interlinked with anyone, that your life doesn't impact anyone, and nobody else's life impacts yours. 
Like, if you remove me from the equation, is it going to make any difference? A bit like one of the people who I spoke to this week who says, loneliness makes you feel forgotten. So we need interaction with people. We need to be interacting. But actually, as a society, we're more connected than ever, aren't we? And of those 3.3 million people, one million of them are our young people. So the highest age group is the 16 to 29s who say that they feel lonely. And it's this age group that are our most connected age group in terms of social media. But if you Google it, you will find endless headlines like, I have two million followers, but no friends. And if you go on to read those articles, then they don't make for pretty reading. And with social media, it's ever so easy to mask who we really are, isn't it? Or just see the highlights of other people's lives. And we can have people that we call friends on social media, but actually we just sort of scroll through their lives passively without interacting. It's a really weird way to do friendship. And we can say that we spend every evening chatting with our friends, but actually we're all in our different homes messaging each other. And in COVID lockdown, we realized, didn't we, like the wonders of um, technology in enabling us to communicate, but also that it's no replacement for physical contact. We totally got that. So it's not about the amount of connections then, but it's about the depth of connection. What matters is that we have got deep connections with people. You could live on your own and not be lonely, or you could live in a house full of people and be lonely. But we need to be fully known and fully accepted. We need to be able to share all of who we are with someone or with a few people, and that will be different whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. But we need to be able to share all of who we are and be accepted. And today, if you're feeling lonely, that may well be because in the past, you, your vulnerability has been abused. It may well be that actually, as you've made yourself vulnerable to people, that, 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 has, been reviewed, that has been abused and it, and it feels really hard then to, to do that again and to put your trust in someone again and, and know that you have a God who knows you fully and who loves you fully. Psalm 139 says, Lord, you know me. You're familiar with all of my ways. I am wonderfully made. Now, obviously Jesus didn't have Instagram or Facebook, but he did have many followers and he did have many connections. So we're going to have a little look at Jesus now and how he navigated that and what we can learn from him in terms, of, um, in terms of our own loneliness. So with Jesus, we see that um, as well as the many people who followed him, some of whom interacted and some of whom just watched from afar, he then had, um, there were 72 people that Jesus sent out. So we know that there was then a slightly wider group of people that he interacted with a bit. And then we know, of course, that he had his 12 disciples who he chose to do life with. And then there were another close three, Peter, James, and John. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's the one. He had John. John describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. There is a fabulous quote in the Jesus I Never Knew book, Philip Yancey book, which was one of our, um, what's it called? Help me out. New Leaf. New Leaf? New Leaf. New Leaf books. And um, I will read you this quote. It's about Jesus and his 12 disciples. Why does Jesus invest so much in these apparent losers? To answer that, I turn to Mark's written account, which mentions Jesus' motives in choosing the twelve. That they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. That they might be with him. Jesus never tried to hide his loneliness and his dependence on other people. He chose his disciples not as servants, but as friends. He shared moments of joy and grief with them, 
and asked for them in times of need. They became his family, his substitute mother and brother and sisters. They gave up everything for him as he had given up everything for them. He loved them, plain and simple. Jesus had a codependency with his disciples. He had really authentic relationships with these men. They saw him laugh and cry and grieve and worship. It wasn't a one-way relationship. Jesus needed these friendships too. And if Jesus needed friends, then how much more do we need friends? And within his 12 disciples, Jesus had his three close friends. Do you remember when he took Peter, James, and John up the hill to see his transfiguration? It's in Luke 9. You can look at it at another point. Um, But it was this incredible moment where Jesus revealed his glory to his friends. This is Jesus revealing more of who he is to those closest to him. And actually what's really heartbreaking is that they don't really get it. We've spoken about the need to be fully known and fully loved. And Jesus' friends didn't ever really fully get who he was, did they, whilst he walked the earth. And at his point of greatest need, his closest friends deserted him. At the time in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he says to them, stay and pray with me, they can't. And then as he faces death, they desert him. Jesus gets it. He knows what it's like to feel lonely. And if you're feeling the gaping hole of loneliness today, then know that Jesus understands. And more than that, but on the cross, Jesus experienced the agonizing separation from his father, who he'd been in constant relationship with. We sung that song, didn't we? The father turns his face away. And he did that so that we don't have to experience that separation from God. We can always be in relationship with our Father God. Like that beautiful opening sentence from Romans 8. About how nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate can separate from the love of God. One clinical psychologist said that in the last 35 to 40 years that he'd been doing psychotherapy, only one person had said to him, I'm lonely. Even though for the majority of his patients, it was one of their primary issues. There is an awful lot of people out there and in here who are lonely, but will not be comfortable admitting it. Because there's a shame felt, there's a shame attached to being lonely. And I think that this is harder for Christians to admit because there's a feeling like we shouldn't be lonely because we've got Jesus. And of course we have got Jesus, but like, where was Adam when God said it wasn't good for him to be alone? He was in the Garden of Eden walking with God. It was before the fall, before the separation, and he's walking with God and still God says, it's not good for this man to be alone. So Like, we need each other. We've been made to have human relationships. So if you think you're the only lonely person out there, you're not. But it's probably likely that other people aren't telling you that they're lonely either. So what do we do? What do we do if we're lonely? Well, I am really cautious to give instruction because it's so painful and it's so hard. So I reflected on my own experience of loneliness And I was thinking about times when I have been lonely and how that cycle of low self-esteem really doesn't help. So you feel lonely and like you've got no friends and then you go into yourself and then you feel like you're not good enough to have any friends and the whole thing becomes a bit of an unhelpful cycle, doesn't it? And I just wonder if we could use this verse from Luke 10, 27. It's quite a famous verse, you'll probably know it. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Luke 10, 27 and on. So love your God, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So I put these 
in a nice Venn diagram for us. I thought we'd stick with Venn diagram. If you're like a data analyst, you might need to turn a blind eye to this because I've been quite liberal with my um, use of the term Venn diagram. But I thought this might be really helpful um, just to think about, um, think about how we address it. So if we think about these things as being interlocking, I think we start here. Um, so if you, if you know God, then like spend time with the one who loves you and let him whisper to you how much he loves you. And as he does that, then actually perhaps your love for yourself will begin to grow a bit. And as you love yourself more fully, then maybe actually you'll begin to have that boldness to give more away of yourself to others and to let others love you. Does that make sense? And I think there is a requirement here that we connect ourselves, like it only works if we're interlocking with people, so there is going to be, we are going to need to get connected. And we're really aware that in a church of 500 people, it can be really difficult to get to know people. And that is why we have small groups. So if you are not in a small group, or there are other midweek groups, can we really encourage you to speak to Richard or speak to someone else, maybe with a dog collar, and, um, and get plugged in? Um, there are also some amazing things that happen in our community, and, um, and we can help signpost you to those. And we've got amazing people called social prescribers who are all about linking us into community. So if you are feeling really on your own, come, come and talk to someone. Come and tell us. Um, and then we will come to the others and God bit in a minute. Um, but we want this church to be somewhere where you feel loved and you feel welcome and you feel like you belong. And certainly, that is Jesus' heart for his church, isn't it? So now we're going to get to the, the, bit, the bit of reading that we read. So that's John 17. Let's see if you can get there quicker than me. <clears throat> Great. So this is God's heart for his church. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. That's verse 21. That they may be one as we are one. Jesus' prayer for us is that we are one with each other in the same way that Jesus is one with God. Like, that's huge, right, if you really think about it. We spoke about the Trinity at the beginning, didn't we, and how the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have been in constant loving relationship with one another. And it's what defines God. And his heart for his church is that we are in constant loving relationship with one another, in and through Jesus. And I thought that, as we were going for Venn diagrams, I'd go for this one. But when I did it, it kind of, it didn't work because there's no overlapping circles all of a sudden, right? So if we roll with, um, if we roll with verse 21 for a minute, just as you are in me and I am in you. So this is Jesus in God and God in Jesus. With us so far, happy? Okay, great. And then the end of verse 21, it says, May they, does it? Where does it say, may they also be in us? <laughs> See if we can find that. Oh yeah, that is verse 31. May they also be in us. So all of a sudden, we're in here, right? With me so far. So we're in the middle, great. And then, verse 23, it says, and I in them and you in me. So all of a sudden, we are like a, you can see why I didn't do this freehand. <laughs> This took varying saucepan lids <laughs> to draw out. <clears throat> so here we are now. We're in a nice, like, Jesus and Father sandwich, aren't we? But, like, this is, this is just to show you what oneness looks like. This is us completely integrated, isn't it? And this is, this is God's heart for us, 
that we are fully in him, but that with one another, we are fully, we're, we're, fu- we're fully for each other. We're fully loving each other. And verse 26 says that we're to love one another with the love that God has for Jesus. I should repeat that. We are to love one another with the love that God has for Jesus. What, what if the church did look like that? What if we did love one another like that, with the same love that Jesus, that God has for Jesus? No wonder this is Jesus' prayer for us. Like, there's no lonely people in that. There's no little circles out on their own. The good news is that we don't have to do it on our own. God's spirit is in us, changing us and transforming us and enabling us to live this way. But we're not there yet, are we? The book, God on Mute, which is also another of our New Leaf ones, um, by Pete Gregg, quotes this passage as Jesus' unanswered prayer. Because the reality is the church doesn't always look like this. And more often than we'd like to admit it, we've got it wrong. We have overlooked people and we have left people out. We've thrown people out. We've let broken friendships stay broken and we've let little cracks turn into rifts. And like, I'm sorry for when we've got it wrong. The church is made up of broken people and people like me who like six foot fences around their lives. And we need to learn to do life with each other. We need to learn to be generous with our lives and to love sacrificially. We need to be a safe place where people can be vulnerable with one another. And when we do it well, it's beautiful. And when we had our baptisms a couple of weeks ago, there were so many who testified here about how they'd come to faith because of the love they had received through this church. How they had felt like family in this church, and that is what had brought them to faith. Verse 23 says, maybe, I've run with verse 23 a lot. Yes, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. When we show this kind of love with one another, others experience that love and they turn to faith. They come to know God. They come to know the God that loves them. So really practically, like how can we be a church like this where no one feels like a little circle out on their own? I've come up with a non-exhaustive list of four S's. I think we need to be a safe place. We need to be safe. So a place where people can be fully known, can be vulnerable enough to let themselves be fully known, knowing that they'll be fully loved. We need to be non-judgmental and quick to forgive and quick to mend fractions and not show the social media highlights of our life. But like vulnerability breeds vulnerability. So let's get a bit messy. So that's safe. And then C, I think we need to look for the lonely amongst us, knowing that they won't always admit that they're lonely. And let's not just see the lonely, but see the, um, see the things that keep them there. So maybe the boundaries that we put up in place. Maybe that's the timings of our groups or the style of our groups or the location. But what is it that, that keeps people lonely? And then the third S is space. So I think we need to create spaces where friendships can grow and just have opportunities for community to thrive. And then share is our fourth S. I think we need to be generous with our lives and with our friendships and with our time. We're not called to be one once a week on a Sunday. And for those of us with full homes and full lives and varying friendships, we need to be aware that others amongst us have very empty homes and very empty diaries. How can we share our lives? So let's be a church where everybody matters and nobody is forgotten. 
And then just to close, I really want us to reflect on how we address the loneliness in our community around us because we're called to bring God's kingdom to the whole world. So let's look for a little minute about how Jesus responded to the lonely around him. Well, our Jesus, he went out of his way, didn't he, to befriend others. He befriended those nobody else would. He went out of his way to restore them back to their community. If I can give you a couple of examples, there's the Samaritan woman. You can read about her in John 4. But she had been shunned by her community. She'd been sleeping around. She wasn't well thought of. And Jesus broke through all the social boundaries to befriend her. And then there was the demon-possessed man. You can read about him in Mark 5. He was out living in the tombs, away from his family, away from his community. And Jesus went well out of his way to get to that man. He crossed the lake just for him. And to both these people, the Samaritan woman and the demon-possessed man, Jesus assures them that he fully knows them and he fully loves them. The Samaritan woman said, come see the man who told me everything I ever did. But she still felt loved by him. And he gives them value and then he restores them back into their own community. They don't become one of the people who follow Jesus and go off living closely like the 12 disciples, but he restores them back where they were. So to the demon-possessed man who wanted to leave with Jesus, he says, go home. Go home to your family and tell them. And the Samaritan woman, she leads like half a village to faith. These lonely, they find their belonging and their purpose in the same community from which they'd previously been ostracized. Jesus is about bringing restoration. He restores the individual and he restores them back into their community. And so I think we need to reflect on how we can bring restoration to our community. And those natural communities that are all around us, how do we help restore broken marriages or broken homes? Think about the work that's done through safe families, preventing children from going into care. How do we bring about community in our streets and amongst our neighbourhoods, chatting with our neighbours? What are the social boundaries around us that need breaking down? talking to that person that nobody else will talk to. And please be praying for our David Alvey at the moment, who's actively just exploring how we might be able as a church to provide a community of hope, somewhere where people can come together and live together and do life together, find community together. Mother Teresa said, the greatest disease in the West today It's not TB or leprosy. It's being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. We can cure physical diseases with medicine, but the only cure for loneliness is love. There are many dying in the world. There are many in the world dying for a piece of bread, but there are many more dying for a little love. We need to be a people who love who love with the love that God had for Jesus. So to sum up, if you're lonely, know that nothing will separate you from the love of God. Nothing. You are fully known and fully loved by him, and it is God's heart for you that you have friends. And we will pray for that in a minute. And his prayer for us as a church is that we are one, that we love one another with the love that God has for Jesus, that no one is left as a circle out on their own. So how can we be safe? How can we be creating spaces? How can we see the people around us? And how can we share more of our lives? And then how can we go about the business of mending broken communities, of bringing restoration to individuals' lives and to the communities that they're in? Should we pray? Let's pray. (coughs) Lord, firstly, I want to lift to you all those here today who are lonely. 
And I pray, Father, that you would come close. I pray that they would hear you whispering your words of love to them. That they would know that nothing can separate them from your love. And I ask, Lord, that you would provide friends for them. I pray that you would show them those little communities that they can begin to interact with. We pray for your provision. And Lord, we pray for ourselves as a church that we would be a church that loves well. We would be a church where it is safe for people to be. To be themselves. We pray that we would be a church that sees, that notices when people are feeling lonely and who gather them in. And Lord, that we'd be a church who are generous with our lives. That we would do life together, not just on a Sunday. And Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for all those who are lonely in our community. We pray that you would bring restoration. We pray that you would be healing broken marriages and broken homes. We pray that, yeah, that we would be a witness, that we would be going out, sharing your love, bringing your kingdom. Louise, thank you so much. Let me encourage you to really take to heart what Louise has shared tonight. There's a vulnerability in community, uh, but it's so precious. I'm sure Louise won't mind me saying on Friday morning, Louise and I shared a moment before Connect where uh, she was telling me about something in her life that's really difficult and I had no answers. And then I told her about something in my life that's really difficult and she had no answers for me, but it totally changed the way I felt. In that moment, it totally changed my day. Um, step out, be brave, be loved, and be ready to love others. It's tremendously fitting, friends, after this passage that we're going to share communion together. Jesus has prayed that we would be in complete unity, verse 23. And communion is a brilliantly unifying moment where we come together to receive bread and wine. Where we remember the body and blood of Jesus given for us on the cross. Jesus is deaf in our place for our sins and his rising from the dead three days later. So all those who know and love and trust in the Lord Jesus are welcome to come to his table and receive from him. And that is something we do together, not as individuals, but as a church family. Jesus bids his disciples to eat and drink and remember. If you're not someone who trusts in Jesus, then why not use this time to reflect on why that is? And perhaps even today, as we dwell on his body broken for us and blood poured out for us, you might want to consider following Jesus for yourself. You're very welcome to come forward and receive a blessing if you'd like to. And if you want to do that, just keep your hands by your side. In a moment... Um, someone will invite you forward and we'll start with the back rows to my left and right. We'll come round and up the central aisle. And when you come forward, please would you fan out across the front and bread and wine will be brought to you. And of course, there is gluten-free bread and alcohol-free wine if you would like it. But for now, let's take a moment of quiet to prepare our hearts to receive. The Lord be with you. 
and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper... Taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, Send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. And so with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling feeding us with the body and blood of your dear son. And we pray that we might remember your sacrifice for us, remembering that as you died for us, so we live for you. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our final song together. Let's stand together. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep
our service is drawing to a close but church isn't there's tea and coffee at the back and prayer available at the front please do enjoy community with one another a final prayer from me almighty God we thank you for the gift of your holy word may it be a lantern to our feet and a light to our paths and a strength to our lives take us and use us to love and serve in the power of the Holy Spirit And in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with you and those you love both now and forever. Amen.